this, and this question is for Ron Paul. I've met a lot of your supporters online, but I've noticed that a good number of them seem to buy into this conspiracy theory regarding the Council of Foreign Relations and some plan to make a North American Union by merging the United States with Canada and Mexico. These supporters of yours seem to think that you also believe in this theory. So my question to you is, do you really believe in all this? Or are people just putting words in your mouth? Well, 90 seconds. Well, it all depends on what you mean by all of this. Uh, the CFR exists, the Trilateral Commission exists, and it's a, quote, conspiracy of ideas. This is an ideological battle. Some people believe in globalism, others of us believe in national sovereignty. And there is a move on uh, toward a North American Union, just like early on there was a, U a move on for a European Union and it eventually ended up. So we had NAFTA and moving toward a NAFTA highway. These are real things. They're, it's not somebody made these up. It's not a conspiracy. They don't talk about it and they might not admit about it, but there's been money spent on it. Uh, there was legislation passed in the Texas legislature unanimously to put a hold on it. They're, they're planning on millions of acres taken by eminent domain for an international highway from Mexico to Canada, which is going to make the immigration problem that much worse. So it's, it's not so much a, a secretive conspiracy, it's a contest between ideologies, whether we believe in our institutions here, our national sovereignty, our constitution, or are we going to further move in the direction of international government, more UN. You know, this country goes to war under UN resolutions. I don't like big government in Washington. So I don't like this trend toward international government. We have a WTO that wants to control our drug industry, our nutritional products. So I'm against all that, but it's not so much a a sinister conspiracy it's just knowledge is out there if we look for it you'll realize that our national sovereignty is under threat congressman paul thank you a special televised meeting of the new york based council on foreign relations provides a window to the real story the speaker vice president dick cheney takes a question from david rockefeller vice president uh, i just enjoyed so much your whole speech but i was particularly pleased that you gave such a strong endorsement for the free trade agreement for all the Americas, subject that has been of great concern to me for many years, and particularly recently, and I think it's absolutely essential for the strength of our economy. Rockefeller's role in the drive for an FTAA was a lot more central than he portrays. Rockefeller cultivated Latin American leaders who could be counted on to support such a proposal. Both the 1994 Miami Summit and the FTAA proposal were conceived and nurtured by a Rockefeller-created network. Prominent among the organizations sponsoring the Miami event were the Council of the Americas, founder and honorary chairman David Rockefeller, the Americas Society, chairman David Rockefeller, the Forum of the Americas, founder David Rockefeller, the Institute for International Economics, financial backer and board member David Rockefeller, the Trilateral Commission, founder and honorary chairman, David Rockefeller. Rockefeller's influence also extends to the current administration. He was chairman emeritus of the CFR when Vice President Dick Cheney once served as a director, a relationship that Cheney concealed during his congressional career. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City, uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about this. And I have a two-part question. First uh, part, are you a member of the CFR? And if your answer is no, do you uh, think that you are possibly the only candidate running on a Republican ticket who is not a member of the CFR? <laughs> It used to be, you know, really 
secretive. Unfortunately for us, they are much bolder. A lot of people know about the CFR and the Trial Battle Commission, but they're very, very influential. I would like to make sure that someday our side has a uh, organization as, as influential as that, and that to be as an intellectual it, uh, you know, influence. But they have. Uh, the CFR and Trial Battle Commission are very influential and are very much controlled, you know, at, uh, at the Wall Street level and the military industrial complex. But I do not know exactly who is and who is not a member who happens to be the candidates. I know that some of them are, are members, but I do not, uh, I don't believe every one of them is a member, would be my guess. But uh, the, the explicit answer to your question is uh, no, I am not a member. <laughs> That's not as James Perloff. James is the author of Truth is a Lonely Warrior, Unmasking the Forces Behind Global Destruction and Shatters of Power, an expose on the Council of Foreign Relations. James was also the screenwriter for uh, Shatter Ring, the latest uh, documentary done by uh, Free Mind Films, correct? That is correct. Uh, and that is uh, actually comes out of the first six chapters of uh, Truth is a Lonely Warrior. It's an intro to the New World Order in video format. Okay, okay. And tonight, of course, we're going to talk about the Council on Foreign Relations, its origins, and the important role it played in the 20th century, and perhaps its uh, key role in building what, you know, for lack of a better word, or it is their term is the New World Order, the Council on Foreign Relations. So what is that all about? Well, the Council is a organization that is, since its inception, devoted to steering American foreign policy towards acceptance of world government. And it's also been the almost monolithic recruiting ground for the American government for cabinet level positions, which is the reason why we only see cosmetic changes when we go from a Democrat to a Republican. So uh, in, in the White House, I should probably talk a little about the council's origins. Um, the council was founded in 1921, and it came into being as a direct result of what had occurred at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. Uh, the, that conference was settling the aftermath of the First World War, and Woodrow Wilson came to that conference with his famous 14 points in hand, and point 14 was a League of Nations. Now, this was a long-term goal of the Illuminati and the cabal that, of bankers that runs our world, the Zionist bankers, was to have a, a single government ruling the world. And that's even something that the Bible prophecies. But the, uh, the League of Nations was the first formal attempt at that, and it was successfully implemented. However, due to the fact that there's a stipulation in the United States Constitution that the president cannot single-handedly make a treaty. It has to be ratified by the Senate. America did not join the League of Nations. The, the Senate rejected the Versailles Treaty that said, uh, you know, our boys have paid enough uh, sacrificing their lives on the European front for $30 a month. And we don't think that we have to see any reason why America over here should um, give up its national sovereignty to some international body. So the League of Nations was rejected. And as a result of that, the bankers who had accompanied Wilson to Paris and dictated everything he did there, held a series of meetings, and finally at a dinner at the Majestic Hotel on May the 30th, 1919, they resolved to form a new organization 
uh, that would change America's mind about world government. And that was incorporated two years later as the Council on Foreign Relations. And um, it's, uh, well, just to give you a, a taste of it, it um, has a journal that uh, it started in 1922. It's still in print called Foreign Affairs. And the very first issue in 1922 had an article called The Next American Contribution to Civilization. And what's that? I'll quote the article. Quote, our government should enter heartily into the existing League of Nations, take a sympathetic share in every discussion broached in the League, and be ready to take more than its share in all the responsibilities which unanimous action of the nations constituting the League might impose, unquote. And um, you can go from there. I'll just give you one more. From the second issue of Foreign Affairs in 1922, we have uh, Philip Carr declaring, quote, obviously there is going to be no peace or prosperity for mankind. As long as it remains divided into 50 or 60 independent states, the real problem today is that of world government, unquote. So that's the, that's their starting point. It is still their their goal today. And uh, as we'll see in the course of tonight, uh, they decided that you can't impose world government from the top down. You've got to do it piece by piece, which is why we have things like the EU and NAFTA. But but that was uh, how they came into being. And uh, they are, you know, the most influential organization that there is in America as far as uh formulating foreign policy goes. Now, uh, the Council of Foreign Relations, it was uh, created in 1921, 1922? 21. 21. Officially. Now, this also coincided with the creation of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in the United Kingdom, in which developed out of the Rhodes uh, Circle, right? That's correct. And this was brought to light by Carol Quigley in his book, uh, Tragedy and Hope. And... Uh, Rhodes was, uh, you know, Cecil Rhodes was, of course, a diamond and mining magnate and pretty amazing to have a country named after you, Rhodesia, right? Um, but uh, when he died, he, he was not married and he didn't have any heirs. And he actually left a large part of his fortune to the Rothschilds, you know, as if they needed it, right? <laughs> um, and Which, his, you guess you may suspect what his role was in that. Yeah, like. <laughs> well, they worked. They had been working together, of course, yeah. and he had this vision that he always talked about of united the uniting the English speaking world. And Tim, as I've looked back on that, I think that that was simply a regional step towards world government. You know, unite the English speaking countries first, mm -hmm. and eventually we'll bring in the non English speaking countries later. But his uh, inheritance, uh, his will, not only created the Rhodes scholarships, but um, they created uh, this trust that uh, Lord Alfred Milner, high-ranking Freemason, and Lord Rothschild were in charge of dispersing. And they created what they called the roundtable groups. And just to quote Quigley, he said, um, uh, quote, the roundtable groups were semi-secret discussion and lobbying groups organized by Lionel Curtis, Philip Carr, who I just quoted, and William Morris in 1908 to 11, this was done on behalf of Lord Milner, the dominant trustee of the Rhodes Trust in the decades 1905 to 1925. The original purpose of these groups was to seek to federate the English speaking world along lines laid down by Cecil Rhodes. And then just to, to tie in the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute, I'm just moving a little further ahead in his book. He says, quote, at the end of the war of 1914, it became clear that the organization of this system had to be greatly extended. The um, front organization called the Royal Institute of International Affairs had as its nucleus in each area, meaning each part of the English-speaking world, the existing submerged round table group in New York. It was known as the Council on Foreign Relations. It was a front for J.P. Morgan and Company in association with a very small American Round Table Group, and he does mention some of the members of this American Round Table Group, people like the journalist Walter Lippmann and uh, Thomas Lamont, who was a partner in J.P. Morgan and Company, and as he also uh, said there, it was a front company for J.P. Morgan and Company. Well, if you take a look at the original leadership of the Council on Foreign Relations back in 1922, the founding president was John W. Davis, who was J.P. Morgan's personal attorney, and the founding vice president was Paul Cravath, who was also a Morgan attorney, and the founding chairman was Russell Luffingwell, who was a partner in J.P. Morgan and Company. So it's definitely a Morgan operation, but just this is kind of interesting. Um, I was just looking at, uh, before tonight's show, I was looking through their current 
uh, annual report. And if you look at the current co-chairs, you have Carla Hills, who's on the board of J.P. Morgan Chase. <laughs> and, uh, of course, J.P. Morgan eventually combined with Chase Manhattan, which was the Rockefeller Bank. And, of course, David Rockefeller, who is still the honorary chairman of the council, was the official chairman from uh, 70 to 85. And his predecessor was John J. McCloy, who was chairman of Chase Manhattan. Um, but you see this this connectivity between J.P. Morgan in 1921 and J.P. Morgan today. It's still the bankers running the show there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found a interesting description of the CFR in an article um, titled, this is in the mid-90s, The Council on Foreign Relations of the New World Order, and it states the December of 1995, and he said, uh, the CFR is the promotional arm of the ruling elite in the United States of America. Most influential politicians, academics, and media personalities are members, and it uses its influence to infiltrate the New World Order into American life. Its experts write scholarly pieces to be used in decision-making. Uh, the academics expound on the wisdom of the of a united world, and the media members disseminate the message. Mm -hmm. And that's how it works. And it appears to be sort of a heterodox opinion, but it really is. It's coming that these ideas are produced and then they're they'll I guess they're um they're kind of spread out throughout the media through academia and it gives the impression of 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 uh, sort of a again again like a diverse opinion but it really is coming from one source you're absolutely right and uh uh it, it obviously was very important to influence public opinion both through the colleges and universities and through the uh mainstream you know, uh, mass media and uh, Quigley, uh, I don't have a quote in front of me, but he commented on the fact that, um, you know, it was very, obviously looked very strange to have a foreign affairs association that just considers, consisted of bankers and lawyers working for the Rockefellers and Morgans. So they quickly brought in college professors. But mm -hmm. as Quigley pointed out, these all came from colleges and universities that were getting big endowments from J.P. Morgan. So they they were people they could count on to come to the council and be indoctrinated in world government and then return to their universities and spread these ideas, just as you were saying. And as a matter of fact, to um, quote from the 2015 annual report, um, it says, uh, it's describing the different initiatives. It says, quote, the academic outreach uh, connects students with CFR research and programming, provides professors with teaching tools to facilitate a deeper understanding of international issues in their classrooms, unquote. So that's yeah. still going on today. And in terms of the media, um, one reason why we have uh, this uh, false consensus, appearance of consensus in the main, mainstream media and why nobody ever questions the war on terror or questions the official narrative of 9-11, of course, you know that there's six corporations that own over 90 percent of our media, but um, I, I talked in uh, one of the chapters of my book, The Shadows of Power, which is actually published in 1988. It's been almost 30 years. I had a chapter on the media contacts back then. But just to look at some of the nexus with uh, the CFR and the media, if you look today at Fox, um, Rupert Murdoch as CFR, and their, um, the chairman and CEO of Fox News is Roger Ailes, who's CFR. And if you go to a Time Warner where you've got CNN, you've got Jeffrey Bukas is the president of Time Warner. He's CFR. And look at their news anchors like uh, that they've had, like Judy Woodruff and Paul Lazan and Aaron Burnett, um, Peter Bergen, you know, all um, uh, CFR. And if you move over to Time Magazine, which is now in, in part of Time Warner, Henry Luce, the founder, was CFR. And Hedley Donovan, who was a longtime editor with CFR, and I don't want to bore people with a lot of names, but just go to CBS, the founder, William Paley, was CFR, and major anchors like Dan Rather, and you go to NBC, its founder, Robert Sarnoff, was CFR, and Tom Brokaw, and today, Brian Williams, are CFR, and they go to the New York Times, the Sulzbergers, who owned it, were CFR, and Leslie Gelb actually is the uh, president emeritus today. Uh, same thing with ABC, Washington Post, uh, Eugene Meyer, who, who took it over in 1933 with CFR, and McNeil Lair of PBS CFR. Yeah. So, you know, you've got the, their hooks uh, all over the media. And so since they 
are indoctrinated in the council's viewpoint, of course, they're going to spread it. And it's the public is going to get this fake impression that there's a consensus when actually that consensus is emanating from one source. And uh, what they do is they'll, they'll uh, produce policy papers or s disseminate memes or ideas throughout the media that appear to be representing the broad interest of, say, the United States, call it national security or economic policy, but it really represents the narrow interest of a few corporations. Uh, that is correct. Yeah. That yeah. is well, correct. Like what's good for GM is good for America, the old, as <laughs> Charles Wilson said back in the 50s, and that's the attitude, this corporatist mentality. Um, but that's – again, what we're looking at is – what we see here is the actual uh, method by which the ruling elite uh, maintain their dominance. Um, I think it was Eric Carol Quigley who wrote uh, about this dominance. He said about investment bankers and said, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in the private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole, controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert, by secret agreements arrived at in frequent meetings, private, sorry, in frequent private meetings and conferences. Now, of course, we can see how it's done through the CFR, through the Royal Institute of International Affairs, through the Canadian Institute of International Affairs, or the Australian Institute of International Affairs, or whatever, because they have these different branches throughout the world. They kind of, uh, and they all meet. Of course, we have examples. We have Davos, the World Economic Forum, with the power elite rub elbows. Uh, of course, there's Bilderberg, which for decades we were told was uh, didn't exist or just something that was uh, dreamt up in the minds of crazy conspiracy theorists. Now it's you know widely covered and admitted. And uh, other things, well, we have the Bohemian Grove uh, meeting, the annual soiree that occurs every year out in California where the power elite get together and uh, <laughs> have fun. And our concerns about what's going on there are supposed to be allayed by the uh, the message uh, uh, that reads, entry in, in, into the uh, into the meeting, uh, weaving spiders come not here. I guess that's supposed to suggest that nothing of ever of anything of uh, importance is, there, is ever done there. No important decisions are ever taken there. But uh, that's, uh, I think, a bit naive. I mean, I was reading an article about Bohemian Grove, and the focus of the article was that the, you know, it's just a party. Nothing, is, nothing important ever happens there. But uh, the photograph that accompanied the article, uh, I guess, was from the late 60s, perhaps around 1967, 68. And the photograph had Richard Nixon sitting at a table with uh, Ronald Reagan, the then governor of California, getting together all these business elite. And, you know, again, it's hard to believe that, that – Policy decisions aren't being taken there in such a gathering. You have two future presidents of the United States meeting with the business elite. If you want to believe that, you know, it's not important, fine, you, you know, go ahead and believe that. But I, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of such a claim. That's right. Uh, there's ways to have fun besides uh, uh, draping yourselves in these hoods before a 40-foot owl and conducting a mock human sacrifice, and uh, ways to have fun that don't require congregating together. Uh, as as this as this body, so uh, I would have to say that yes, there's definitely uh, significant discussions, even though we don't get to know what they are, yeah. that are taking place about uh, who's going to be uh, taking over the Fed and who's going to be the next president and vice president and things of that nature. I'm sure are on their lips, um, and and when you have uh, people who are in uh, with that kind of power being wielded, I'm sure that they they're not just there to play games of darts and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, again, we're, you, you talk about uh, media, the control of the media, which is key to this. Um, of course, uh, we're talking about the, the CFR's control of the media and how all the major uh, networks and publication firms belong to it, or at least their editors, the people of, import, of importance of those organizations belong to the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, but the press itself has always, been, somewhat, has always been controlled by powers that be in this country. I mean – you the Pulitzer Prize is named after Joseph Pulitzer, who was, you know, who was a uh, leader of what was called yellow journalism. Mm -hmm. And so the, the prizes, Very appropriate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the prizes that our journalist members of the Fourth Estate covet is a prize named after a uh, ardent uh, or a, a, a out out, uh, out of the closet yellow journalist, right? I mean, <laughs> so we won't be too surprised that you know, media news media is going to be, uh, you know. Biased or manipulated in some way to serve a, 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 a larger political end or a geopolitical end there. Yeah, it is interesting that he named it after Pulitzer because he was a uh, a propagandist. He was a big propagandist for the Spanish American War, which I uh, my last show with Corbett was on. Uh, we talked more about William Randolph Hearst, uh, but I think that uh, 
the way they probably didn't call it the Hearst Prize. <laughs> I don't yeah. really know the history of it, but Hearst eventually uh, kind of turned on them a little bit. He uh, he actually uh, went against going into World War One, and I, I think that's uh, he fell a little out of favor, and that's probably why they were able to uh, make uh, the uh, Orson Welles uh, depiction of him that was unf- unflattering. That's right. Yeah. Um, which is usually they won't do it their own unless you've done something that irritates them. So I guess the, they were, they gave it uh, the Pulitzer Prize to number two in the propaganda, Yellow Journalism, which was Pul- Joseph Pulitzer in his uh, New York world. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, with the with the media, we, we had a Frank, Frank Wisner as a mighty Wurlitzer. Uh, his, his, you know, he said he could play America like an organ, which used the media. And he was uh, good friends with uh, Philip Graham of the Washington Post. And um, it's come out now that, you know, the – Ben Bradley, the you know, crusading editor in chief of the Washington Post during the Watergate era, was tied to, to the agency when he worked in Europe, working, you know, uh, posting propaganda pieces and getting intel. Uh, um, and what's strange enough that that, that is, uh, well, one thing you mentioned, William Perley, because he was CBS and he came from the OSS, and Sarnoff had mm-hmm. either OSS or OWI during the war. Um, so a lot of the people who went into media uh, in the, the, the dawn of modern media after World War II emerged from the psychological warfare offices of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the United States government during World War II. Um, so it's not too surprising that, we, that our media would be you – know, the sources of our information, whether it's print or electronic, would be manipulated uh, by greater powers because you know, that's what it's founded on. Of course, then we have Operation Mockingbird, right, which <laughs> – Oh yes, that was brought up by the Church Committee, yeah. and and you're quite right too about the uh, uh, Office of War Information. They would have honed their propaganda skills and honed them very well. You know, the stereotypical films about uh, the Japanese, our enemy, and mm-hmm. and so forth. And uh, those could now be, they've been well, they've been uh, you know making up uh, atrocity stories for years now. Uh, mm-hmm. That that goes back to the yellow journalism of William Randolph Hearst when he t- claimed that in Spain. That, I mean, I'm sorry, in Cuba, that the Spanish were roasting Cuban priests and uh, were throwing the Cubans to sharks. And, of course, that was all made up, mm-hmm. like the baby incubator stories that got us into mm-hmm. the Gulf War. But they wanted to get us into the Spanish-American War for multiple reasons, but probably very close to the top of the risk was to get control of the Cuban sugar industry. Mm-hmm. As uh, Mark Twain later said, it was all about the price of sugar. But uh, but uh, atrocity stories, manipulation of pop- public opinion – that is what the media uh, is really about, is is control. And uh, even before, I mean, going back even further, we're, we're going back before World War I. Uh, of course, we mentioned Pulitzer and Hearst and all that, but uh, the Wall Street interest. Um, uh, in 1914, there was a speech on the Senate floor by uh, Senator Calloway that uh, talked about how J.P. Morgan interest had, <laughs> yes. uh, had bought up 25 of America's leading newspapers – to promote America's entry in, into the war, which was raging at that time, world war, the First World War, the Great War. And this is another example how you know, these interests would buy up these newspapers, these corporate interests. And, of course, we, well, that's what we have today, right? I mean, Well, I could actually quote Callaway right now. Mm-hmm. I, uh, here's what he said. It's actually 1917. This is straight out of the congressional record. Here's what he said, quote, in March 1915, the J.P. Morgan interest – the steel shipbuilding and powder interest, that would be DuPont, and their subsidiaries got together 12 men high in the newspaper world and employed them to select the most influential newspapers in the United States uh, to control generally the policy of the daily press of the United States. They worked the problem out by selecting 179 newspapers and then began by an elimination process to retain only those necessary for the purpose of controlling the general policy of the daily press throughout the country. The founders only necessary to purchase the control of the 25 greatest papers. The 25 papers were agreed upon. Emissaries were sent to purchase a policy, national and international, of these papers. An agreement was reached. The policy of the papers was bought to be paid for by the month. An editor was furnished for each paper to properly supervise and edit information regarding the questions of preparedness, militarism, financial policies, and other things of national and international nature considered vital to the interest of the purchasers. This policy also included the suppression of everything in opposition to the wishes of the interests served, unquote. And uh, so that's 1917. And it, this is a hot topic in for some congressmen because they were trying to keep us out of the war in 1917. That was when we declared war. And I'm sure that Callaway was uh, on that minority, in that minority that were against it. Um, 
along with people like uh, Bob LaFollette, who exposed the whole Lusitania affair and was threatened with impeachment until Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan, who'd resigned over the pro-war policy, came forward and, and uh, confirmed what he said about the Lusitania. But you can move it ahead to um, 1937. Uh, Ferdinand Lundberg wrote a magnificent book called America's 60 Families. And uh, I, I went for a long time without reading that, and I was so glad that I finally got caught up with it. You know, it's out of print. I had to get an old library copy. But he's got a full chapter on there, uh, Tim, on uh, media control, which uh, in 1930s mostly consisted of uh, the newspapers. There was no Internet and no TV. Um, but he showed uh, he went from coast to coast, and he showed that uh, virtually every major newspaper or newspaper chain was owned by America 60 or somebody was fronting for them. And there are very few exceptions. I think he, he said that the Howard Scripps chain was one chain that they hadn't got their hands on yet. But they basically had America's media locked up in 1937. Of course, that was another ideal time to be owning all the media because you're about to get us into another war. Mm -hmm. And that's why they got it was his father Coughlin got kicked off the radio, too. At the time. I, I haven't heard the story of how he got kicked off radio, but I sure enjoy listening to or reading the transcripts of some of the, you know, he was like Benjamin Friedman. He was one of those few guys out there that you could actually turn to and hear what was really going on in America because he wasn't owned. Yeah. And back then, America still had some diversity. They had that sort of that Midwestern conservative mm -hmm. opposition to the to the eastern seaboard. And then, right. of course, that was uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, illustrated or manifested best in the American First Committee, which became slandered, you know. As being pro-Nazi yeah. because they they weren't uh, active supporters of America's entry into the war. Of course, they did after Pearl Harbor. They fell into line like everyone else, which is one of the reasons why that op that operation was pulled off um, to get everyone <clears throat> get everyone mar marching off the war. Um, yeah, but it, yeah. You also back then you also had uh, uh, regional business interests uh, that um, supported. You know, they reflected the values of their region, whether it was the Michigan or Midwest, and they were very Opposed FDR's drive the war, and they 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 formed the financial support for um, for um, the American First Committee. Uh, the, the owners of Sears, the Sears Roebuck Company, or General Wood, and these guys were big funders for the American right. First Committee. Um, of course, now that would be impossible because now we live in such a globalized economy that there's no such thing as a, a localized business that has a loyalty to a, to a to a region or or a, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, region of the country that wasn't so much, that was wasn't so much the case in the 1930s we still had these regional businesses you're right uh <clears throat> part of the consolidation process is political so you, you know the eu is an example of political consolidation um the common market and nafta mm -hmm. examples of economic consolidation but they also have of course these business mergers and you have, you know, your corporations moving in, your Walmarts, you know. And, yeah, you mentioned uh, that the truth is an only warrior. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's chapter 10. Uh, well, I forget which chapter it's in, but yeah. the fact that the mom and pop businesses and the smaller local businesses are either put out of business by the big corporate interests or they get bought out. Uh, there's even been uh, concern within the organic food industry that more and more suppliers of organic foods are being bought out by the big multinationals because yeah. they can come forward with, uh, you know, millions of dollars and buy, offer more than the company's worth. And few people will resist that um, on grounds of principle alone. Uh, many people will give in. And then, of course, they've got their, their hands on the food industry. So there's a consolidation process, even extends into religion, which is with ecumenism, oh, yeah. so, you know, one world religion. But but you're right. Uh, they, they took that out. But you, just to get back to America first for a moment, um, there's a famous quote from uh, Admiral Chester Ward, who was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, they made a mistake when they let him in. He was former judge advocate of the U.S. Navy, he resigned in disgust. But here's what he said. He said um, that the council objective is, quote, submergence of U.S. sovereignty into an all-powerful one-world government. This lust to surrender the sovereignty and independence of the United States is pervasive throughout most of the membership. In the entire CFR lexicon, there is no term of revulsion carrying a meaning so deep as America first, unquote. <laughs> Uh, Admiral Ward, and of course he is referring. Admiral uh, Ward is referring to um, Admiral, uh, uh, to the America First Committee um, of uh, Charles Lindbergh and uh, General Wood. 
And that is something that uh, really ticked off these New World Order guys. They did not want nationalism. Uh, they degraded that as isolationism. And isolationists, uh, the, to use their term, were not against uh, international communi uh, uh, communications, uh, but they simply wanted us to re retain our sovereignty and to uh, follow the principles of America's founding fathers and not become entangled in foreign wars. Yes, yes, because uh, you lose control of your own nation when that happens. Of course, we see that today mm -hmm. with the various interests, the, the, the very strong, you know, uh, is is Israeli or Jewish lobby is related to yeah. Israel? Uh, oh, it's worse than ever. Yeah. yeah, and of course in the 30s, uh, you you had that too. But you, but the biggest thing you had uh, British influence. The British. Everyone talks about German Nazi or German fifth columnists. No one talks about British fifth columnists. <laughs> you know, working in this because they they had they they were in league with the White House and the Eastern Seaboard, uh, you know, the Anglophile Eastern Seaboard interest and all that. So, but um, yeah, I mean you, you had that going on and. You had to destruct you – know, the, the American First Committee just simply wanted to maintain America's sovereignty and st steer clear of European, these European wars. And, but but if it were a good example of how – what influence the, the, the war party had back then was they had, they had everything at their – they had all, pretty much all the communications and the media mm -hmm. at their disposal because even Hollywood was in league. You know? Correct. Uh, if you look at movies like um, Gunga Din uh, coming out in 1940-41, uh, Sergeant York – you know, uh, 1941. That's no, no coincidence. You also had movies like Casablanca, where you know Rick is supposed to be the isolationist, right? The American expat who doesn't want to get involved in the fight, but inevitably he, he realizes this, realizes well, nope, he can't. He can't not stay out of the conflict, and he begins this beautiful relationship with the French. Uh, you know, with the uh, with the uh, the the, uh, the uh, chief of police there at the end. You know, this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship, and the movie ends. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's well, a movie against against like so-called isolationism. <laughs> they hired the best, and actually, one of the screenwriters for that also uh, uh, wrote the screenplay for Mission to Moscow, uh, which came out during the war. Which is really, I think, the most pro-communist movie, perhaps that Hollywood ever produced. Oh yes, yeah, Joseph uh, Davies' uh, book. Um, Joseph Davies, uh, based on his book. Yeah. Um, Just that he was bribed, wasn't? Didn't he get received a bunch of money from uh, like jewels <laughs> and paintings from the from the from the from the Bolsheviks? Uh, well, I know he did very very well for himself, yeah. uh, he, and he was a very also very high ranking Freemason, as was Roosevelt, and so it was a big push on to support the war effort. And it's interesting you're mentioning uh, Sergeant York. I don't know if we touched on this before. It was released uh, in September of '41. I think it was just, <laughs> just uh, you know, just a few weeks before Pearl Harbor. And this movie was about a Sergeant York who'd been reluctant. It yes. was a true story, basically, but he was a guy who was, uh, for religious release reasons, was reluctant to enlist in World War One. Gary Cooper and he did it. Did enlist, became a hero, and now the message was: Look, if It'll be like Sergeant York. We just got bombed. Hey, you got to enlist, go and fight in Europe, just like Sergeant York did. Yeah. And I believe Gary Cooper won the Oscar as Best Actor for that. They're pretty good at handing out Oscars for, you know, um, Gentleman's Agreement, getting the Oscar in March of 1948, and then Harry Truman recognizing Israel in May of 1948. Of course, yeah, Gentleman's yeah, Agreement yeah. being about uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the problem of anti-Semitism in America and of course, we all know about uh, the movie Pearl Harbor coming out strategically in between PNAC calling for a new Pearl Harbor and the actual 9-11 event. The movie came out in May of 2001 to prepare America, uh, even though Touchstone's Pictures, to my knowledge, had never produced a war movie or a patriotic movie prior to that. Mm -hmm. So Hollywood is definitely, and I know you've done shows on, did one recently on Hollywood PSYOPs, but Hollywood definitely throughout the years has um, timed its movies for strategic impact on American opinion. Yeah, I was listening to a, a talk um, about that. He said there was a movie that involved – I forget what the name of the movie was. But this is because an illustration of how it's done is the, – the, you know, because the, the, a lot of these movies require – they request help from the Pentagon for use of equipment, right. scenery, advice. And in return for that, the Pentagon – gets to rewrite the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> so it's then they have the liaison office. So basically um, they'll turn a movie into a propaganda thing for the, for the Pentagon or U.S. foreign policy or something. And they, you know, they've done studies like Tom Secker, who's done research in Hollywood and CIA and the Pentagon. They, the Pentagon has been involved in shows like Cake Wars. So it's a big PSYOP thing. And it's hard to know what their objective is. But I do think a lot of these shows it's, are some sort of cultural programming and, 
And Definitely. so, although it may not be overt, but they're involved in these shows that have nothing to do, you know, they have nothing to do with the military, but you'll, you'll, they're, they're involved in the, in the production of these shows. But this one show involved a terrorist attack, and the script didn't involve, it didn't really, it was supposed to be a domestic terrorist attack, but uh, the Pentagon said, it will help you, but switch it to make the terrorists from this country. And it was a country that the U.S. was ready would would bomb in, in the next six six to twelve months, you know. Oh, we're always being prepped. In fact, um, like what? Uh, why? Why? Why, I, why is the crazy Libyans in uh, Back to the Future? Remember that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, actually, uh, as uh, 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 the war on terror unfolded, beginning with Reagan bombing Libya in 1986, you suddenly had all these movie psyops. You know, yeah, it was the Libyans in Back to the Future, mm -hmm. and uh, there was another movie, um, Not Without My Daughter. Um, about a woman trying to get her daughter out of uh, crazy Iran. And uh, there was Delta Force and all these movies that were suddenly gearing us up for the new enemy. Uh, I've got an article on my website, jamesproloff.com. It's called, Did the Cold War End So That the War on Terror Could Begin? Because, Tim, uh, we, maybe we've discussed this on your show. I can't remember. I but <laughs> I, I had this, uh, when Glasnost uh, occurred, uh, it came, set kind of shockwaves to us in the anti-communist movement. I was writing for the New American Magazine and like, oh, how come the communists, it just didn't seem like they would voluntarily give up their power. And we're trying to evaluate that. But in retrospect, as I look back on it, um, you know, obviously what should have happened when the Cold War ended, what should have happened is that uh, we should have turned our budget to domestic things. Uh, there should have been no longer a need for a big military budget. But what happened is Gorbachev came to power in 1985. Uh, Reagan bombed Gaddafi in 86 based on a false flag psyop pulled off by the Mossad. And you can read that in uh, the book, The Other Side of Deception by Viktor Ostrovsky, a former Mossad agent, how they Mossad planted a Trojan uh, uh, transmitter in um, Libya to make it look like Libya had bombed uh, uh, this American disc attack. And then in 1991, the Soviet Union broke up. And in 1991, we fought our first uh, land war in uh, the Middle East, the, the Gulf War of 91. And so you see this progression out of the Cold War into the war on terror. Um, but Hollywood very much uh, bringing us along with the new enemy, the Arabs and the Muslims. That's right, because before, prior to that, Arabs were kind of treated as being somewhat exotic, and all of a sudden they become demonized as the, as the new enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, because uh, uh, well, you know, was it, of course you have Lawrence of Arabia, and, <laughs> and of course that involves World War One and the intrigues of uh, uh, you know of the of the of the British breaking up the Ottoman Empire and getting into the Middle East. Um, but yeah, you have this coordination with with the media, and Hollywood just is one more element. But if you really at the top, the corporations that and the people that run Hollywood are are integrated into this Council on Foreign Relations. Even various actresses and actors and directors, all CFR guys, so and, and gals. So it, the, the connections are all. This is one again. This is another example how the, C, the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a representative or agent of the powers that be, the financial interests, the corporate interests, the the ruling elite, as how they implement their agenda and how they uh, you know they how they influence policy and they give the appearance again of heterodox opinion of of consensus but it really is it's emanating from a single source to promote the narrow interest of the people that uh, run a handful of corporations you know so but you, you call it um, you've called it a factory of u.s foreign policy uh can you give us examples of that uh certainly um the United Nations came out of the the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, what happened was when World War II began, their executive director, uh, Walter Mallory, went with the editor of Foreign Affairs, Hamilton Fish Armstrong, down to Washington and met with the Assistant Secretary of State, George Messersmith, who was also a member of the CFR. And they reached an agreement that the CFR would start to uh, help uh, quote unquote, uh, the State Department formulate its wartime policy, and they produced almost 700 papers for the Roosevelt administration and began basically to take over the State Department. And uh, it was a group of CFR members called the Informal Agenda Group that actually generated the plan for the United Nations. And the reason they called themselves Informal Agenda Group 
was because they had this bad memory of how the Senate had got wind of how bad the League of Nations might turn out to be, and they didn't want the Senate to interfere. And so by choosing the name Informal Agenda Group, nobody's going to look <laughs> into a group that has a boring name like that. But uh, the UN, of course, became a very significant organization uh, when it held its founding conference in San Francisco in 1945. 47 of the U.S. delegates were members of the Council on Foreign Relations. It was their baby the whole way. And, of course, that was successfully implemented this time. The, the, the uh, Senate was given very little time to debate this time around. And uh, you and I have done a show on the Korean War, but uh, the first regrets on joining the U.N. started to come in with the Korean War because Harry Truman sent troops to Korea. Uh, we had over 30,000 dead and 100,000 wounded. And he did not bother getting a declaration of war. He didn't even bother to consult the Congress because he said he was doing this uh, in response to our the our UN's call for UN action, and it was a police action, and he was obliged under the treaty. So uh, they formulated that. But um, another example uh, would be the Marshall Plan, uh, which, uh, according to you know the mainstream media version, as it was thought up by General George Marshall, but. Um, Students of the CFR have uh, revealed that it was actually formulated at the Council on Foreign Relations by a study group that had David Rockefeller as its secretary. It's amazing how long this guy's been around. We're talking 1947, he was active. Um, and the reason that Marshall was picked to present the Marshall Plan, it was originally going to be called the Truman Plan, but uh, in their discussion, they decided that if Truman introduced it, the Republicans might oppose it and think it was a Democratic boondoggle. And so since Marshall was misperceived as being politically neutral, he was actually very much under the shadow and wing and control of the uh, powers that be. Uh, by having a general introduce it, it could get bipartisan support in that work. It got bipartisan support, and the Marshall Plan had a couple of um, goals. One was to use taxpayer money to subsidize corporations to send these goods to Europe uh, on the pretext that uh, Europe was starving. And uh, the second was to actually, the funds were actually used to jumpstart what would ultimately become the EU. They, uh, the Europeans actually had to pay for Marshall Plan goods with something called counterpart funds. These were was printing press money. And the man in charge of those funds was none other than John J. McCloy. And then uh, in 1947, Jean Monnet, who Time Magazine called the father of Europe, sent his delegates to McCloy and said that they needed funds to for a program for European unity. So uh, Marshall Plan funds were actually converted into what was called the Council of Europe and newspapers and college programs to promote uh, European unity. All of this eventually became the common market and ultimately the EU. Uh, so without even knowing it, American taxpayer funds uh, supported the creation of the EU. And that's what the Marshall Plan was um, basically about, profit and consolidate, political consolidation, but sold to Americans as helping the needy and dreamed up by an American general, but actually a product of the CFR. Because uh, one thing I realized about uh, the, this uh, cabal, a clack of, of people, is they're monopolists. Mm -hmm. And they seek not only do they seek to monopolize their own given industry, they seek a political monopoly too, because that way they can also further extend their control. They're not just their profits, but their control of the world. That's how they get into these countries. The IMF and World Bank are used to uh, pry uh, open markets of third world countries that and and let them get access to the resources to those countries on the cheap through the issuances of uh, use of debt as a weapon. And that's um, again one method that they use. Uh, to uh, to um, you know control uh, control these countries. You control the countries, you control the local governments, local sat trap regimes. You get in there, and you can uh, get them to kick off uh, you know native people off their ancestral homelands, throw them into the cities, and you, you get the resources cheap. You can pollute without any problems, and then you also have a source of cheap labor in the cities, which then you can export the factories to these areas. When the cost of labor gets too expensive here in the United States, and they call that free trade. <laughs> Amazing! Uh, you've just summarized it very well, and I should I mean, mention that the the World Bank and 
uh, uh, IMF are another example of something that was uh, generated by the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, officially, of course, they were created at the Bretton Woods Conference of 1944, but all of the initial groundwork and planning was done before Bretton Woods by the uh, War and Peace a studies project of the CFR, which I just mentioned, they had a, a branch called within that called the Economic and Finance Group, and they're the ones who dreamed up the World Bank and the IMF, and uh, they were formally instituted at Bretton Woods. But that's another CFR project. So again, they are like a factory of American foreign policy. That the irony is, Tim, that Americans didn't even know that the CFR existed. The first major article to appear about it was uh, 1958, an article by Joseph Kraft called School for Statesmen, and I believe that was in Harper's. Um, but uh, there was uh, not on, you know, basically they were operating without any public knowledge. Of course, the main media organs like the New York Times were not going to talk about it. And eventually they'd be mentioned here or there. And now, of course, they've got a website um, and they're more uh, open but uh, uh, it is ironic that uh, a group that had uh, almost monolithic um, control of our foreign policy was not even – their very existence was not known to the American public. Well, much like the NSA, right, for decades, <laughs> and or CIA for that matter. Of course, they came out kind of in the late 50s. People got kind of got a general idea of that. Movie. People started making movies about it, uh, like North by Northwest and things like that. But – um. Um, yeah, quote. Well, now they have a Washington office, as Hillary Clinton was uh, happy to say, because she said, as she said in her speech, she doesn't have to go to New York now to receive her orders, and she said that as, as Secretary of State. <laughs> so, Wait, well, I'll give I'll give the folks the exact quote yeah. um, from Hillary, and they can see this on YouTube. But she said, um, "This she's speaking at their Washington branch. They, they started in New York City because that's where the banks are, but eventually they decided if they wanted to control." Washington, it'd be nice to have a branch down there. So here's what Hillary said, quote, I have been often to, I guess, the mother's ship in New York City, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. We get a lot of advice from the council. So this means I won't have to, as far to go to be told what we should be doing and how we should think about the future, unquote. Kind of a, um, a uh, vivid uh, admission that the council does set policy and tell uh, our uh, officials what to do. Yeah, uh, and a good like, example of how, how it gets done, business gets done, is uh, Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, okayed about $150 billion of arms sales to uh, various terrorist, you know, you know rep, uh, repressive regimes around the world, and they in turn okay. donated <laughs> money to the Clinton Foundation. Yeah, isn't it amazing how that yeah. works? And I guess there's no limit on uh, donations to the foundation, whereas there are uh, limits on political, uh, overtly political uh, uh, campaign contributions. Certainly. And, I, of course, the, the World Bank is there or the IMF is there to make sure that the money is loaned to these governments to buy these weapons, that the taxpayers, after which the taxpayers ultimately underwrite, because that's how the system is set up with these third world loans. Um, and, of course, the, the taxpayers underwrite the loans ultimately, and the collateral for the loans are is the uh, – you could say is other resources of said countries. <laughs> so. Yeah, they've been doing that for a long time. Uh, that that's how the game works. And of course, the uh, the IMF and the World Bank are are backed by the good faith of the American taxpayer. But uh, you're mentioning Hillary. I my latest post is actually on Hillary, and it's actually just a collection of um, cartoons, memes, and funny videos <laughs> about Hillary. Because I sometimes I, I feel that humor is more effective than just writing a serious essay. But um, I actually feel that the establishment has picked her, uh, at least as their favorite choice as president. And the reason I, I, I say that, Timothy, is that um, she's the only candidate that is viable, that seems to be 100 percent what the Rothschilds and the powers that mm -hmm. be want. I mean, she's pro-gun control. She's pro-Israel. She's pro-war on terror. She's pro-Fed. She's pro-GMO. She's pro Monsanto, pro She's pro mass immigration she's pro population control she's pro internet censorship and a, a couple of other clues are she's gotten more money from wall street and goldman sachs than any other candidate except maybe jeb bush depends on the analyst uh, tallying up the numbers and also she was made secretary of state it seems like 
the probable main purpose of that was to give her a credential um, or one of the main purposes was to give her a credential to run for the White House with. Also, after she was Secretary of State, CBS came yes. up with a show, <laughs> show called Madam Secretary, which is p- promoting her and profiling her in a positive way every week to millions of viewers. And the other reason I think that they're they're backing Hillary, Tim, is that she's already they already trusted her for two terms in the White House behind Bill. And of course, Bill will be going right back in the White House if we elect her. So I think their money's on Hillary. I think that um, uh, they wouldn't mind having a socialist in there. But Bernie Sanders is too anti-banker and Trump is too anti-immigration. And he says he's got a is pro Second Amendment. So I don't think they would allow either one. And so I think that the powers that be have her lined up. But, uh, of course, there are problems. But we saw already that they had no trouble um, sweeping Bill Clinton's um, scandals under the uh, carpet. So yeah. I think that they may be planning to do the same with Hillary's with her email, and et cetera. Well, she clearly violated, and, uh, violated this, her security agreements and oaths when she uh, had her aides, uh, you know, uh, cut off the classification on those uh those emails and she put them on her her server it's a clear violation of security and anyone lower down the rung would have already you know been indicted if not convicted um for for that so well i remember when bill clinton was president um he had because as you know he had many scandals there was the, not only the women but there was whitewater and there was mm-hmm. perjury and there were reports of the overseeing drug deals when he was in the governor of uh, Arkansas and murders, con- murder connections and travel gate and China gate. And, you know, every time one of those scandals came up in conservative media, they said, this is it. He's going to be impeached. And you know what, Tim, two weeks later, the, it would all be forgotten about and it would be back to business as usual. So I'm afraid that uh, because we've got that pattern established for the Clintons, that the same thing is going to happen here, that so much power is going to be wielded on her behalf that uh, they're going to just show us they can get anyone elected no matter what. Yes. Um, but I, I'm not sure of that, but that's just how I feel it's trending. Mm-hmm. Now, um, yeah, so basically we've demonstrated that all the major policy decisions uh, that were taken all originated out of the CFR, pretty much the, the, the post-war era, the institutions, or well, CFR ideas. And, of course, I think uh, the Department of Homeland Security was a idea that was spawned by a committee that was, I think, populated by members of the CFR. Correct? And that was before 9-11, right? Uh, that's correct. In fact, uh, let me just uh, grab that information for you. It was a committee that had uh, 12 members, um, nine of whom were in the CFR. And um, goodness, uh, I'm going to have trouble finding that exact reference. Um so good my index is here. Wait a minute. But the, the interesting point is this was this was I think the, the idea was submitted before the events of 9/11. Okay, here it is. Yeah. Um, it was the uh, United States Commission on National Security uh, proposed a National Homeland Security Agency in 1998, and National Homeland Security Agency is the very phrase. President Bush used three years later after 9-11. So yeah. that was nine out of 12 were CFR members on that. Remember, the CFR is has less than 5,000 members. And, and when Kennedy was president, they only had about 900. So yet they've managed to dominate. I should mention the dominance. We haven't mentioned that, the numbers yet. But um, to sum up uh, uh, the current tally, 19 secretaries of state have been members of the CFR, 21 secretaries of the Treasury, 23 defense secretaries, which includes the older War Department, and 16 CIA directors. And I'd like to just stop there and mention why they concentrate on particularly dominating these departments. Obviously, they want the Treasury Department because they want to control the flow of money. They want the Defense Department because they want to be able to control the wars. They want the State Department because it's our foreign policy that generates those wars usually. And, of course, they uh, want the CIA to control intelligence uh, both foreign and domestic. So they're particularly focused, but uh, broadly they dominate uh, cabinet. So if you look at the current cabinet of Obama, Secretary of State John Kerry is a member, Treasury Secretary J- Jacob Lew is a CFR member, as was his predecessor, Timothy Geithner. 
Ashton Carter, the current Secretary of Defense, is a member. His predecessor, Chuck Hagel, and his predecessor, Robert Gates, all working for Obama, were all CFR. The Director of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, is CFR, as was his predecessor, Napolitano. Over at Commerce, uh, Penny Pritzker is a member. At Energy, Ernest Moniz is a member. And Joe Biden's a member. And you go back through time, you go back to Bush, Cheney was a member, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, Paul Wolfowitz. Uh, Bill Clinton had 12 CFR members in his cabinet. So they they dominate through time. And this is, again, one of the reasons why you see only minor changes when, you know, Obama became president. A lot of believing Democrats thought he was going to end the wars in the Middle East. In fact, he had promised during his campaign that his first day in office, he would order the troops home from Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, uh, years and years later, they're, st they're st still there, right? Um but the reason, one reason why we have so little change is because you're electing the same guys. They just take off the Republican stick pins from their label and put on a Democrat stick pin. But it's the same CFR controlling our policy. President Kennedy once complained about this. Uh, he said, why don't I ever see any new faces when somebody handed him a list of uh, State Department personnel to pick? Yeah, he eventually got the message, didn't he? Uh, as some would say, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so um, yeah, I think he was invited to the CFR, but never showed, from what I understand. Well, interestingly enough, uh, his name never appeared on the roster of the Council on Foreign Relations, but he did write a letter stating that he was a member. And I don't know what the reason for that is. It may have been a mistake, or perhaps he was a silent member that mm -hmm. was not on their roles. I don't know the reason. He said he was a member, but uh, he never was listed but, <laughs> officially. So we're looking at the base of the CFR again. We describe it is a. Uh, uh, it's 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 been called uh, I would call it one of these imperial brain trusts mm -hmm. that do the the work of the ruling elite, the corporations, the banksters that run the world, and, and with the veneer of uh, some sort of uh, disinterested or less independent think tank. Um, but basically, it represents, for lack of a term, Wall Street, the banks, the moneyed interests. Um, uh, so they can go on exploiting uh, the world, and if you look at uh, something, uh, if you look at something like the CIA, and how it grew out of the, this financial elite itself, uh, uh, the I think uh, when it was formed, the committee that was formed to write the draft proposal for the CIA was full of a whole bunch of Wall Street bankers and bond salesmen. <laughs> so you know, people like Robert Lovett, uh, Alan Dulles himself, and uh, and his brother John Foster Dulles were both CFR members, and they both were worked for the you know, Sullivan and Cromwell uh, law firm, which uh, did the bidding for U.S. multinational corporations. Um, and in fact, they're the best example. Uh, those two are the best examples, best uh, you get, uh, illustration or embodiment of this sort of this corporatist fascist system we, we live under. You know, right? Alan Dulles was in fact the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, and uh, his brother uh, John Foster Dulles was a founding member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he actually contributed an article to the very first issue of Foreign Affairs in 1922. He also helped draft the UN Charter. Uh, you're talking about a globalist uh, extraordinaire. Mm -hmm. Because he, he was at Versailles. He was at Versailles as, yeah, yeah. I believe, legal counsel to the American yeah. delegation, along with uh, who Paul Warburg, the founder of the Fed, was there, and Bernard Baruch, who made over $100 million in profits off World War One. They were all there surrounding Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. And the, in the, uh, <clears throat> the Dulles brothers themselves, because they went, went on to dominate foreign, U.S. foreign policy in the, in the immediate post-war era uh, throughout the 50s. And, of course, it was Dulles, Alan Dulles, who was uh, immediately sacked by uh, JFK after the Bay of Pigs debacle. And, of course, he oversees the investigation of JFK's assassination. So, <laughs> there Yeah, you he go. was on that team uh, along with John J. McCloy. So, I mean, what we're looking at here is, is an oligarchy. And I don't think it's – I mean, America's descent into oligarchism or becoming an oligarchy has been a gradual thing. It's, I guess you could say the money interests have always existed from the get-go, but they really consolidated, seem to consolidate – Consolidate their power in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, this had probably had something to do with the aftermath of the U.S. Civil War. America as a, you know, the, the federal government consolidating its power over the country. Mm -hmm. um, but lately, there was a study out of Princeton. Was it Princeton University? It said the United States is an oligarchy. 
And he says, America is no longer a democracy. Never mind the democratic republic envisioned by the founding fathers. Rather, it has taken a turn down elitist lane and become a country led by a small dominant class comprised of powerful members who exert total control over the general population. An oligarchy said a new study jointly conducted by Princeton and Northwestern universities. <laughs> well, how do you like that? Uh, Princeton actually yeah. affirms what the truth movement's been say, saying for uh, over, uh, well, over a decade, long over a decade, depending on uh, uh, your uh, view of the, what the truth movement is. But um, uh, more and more of us, uh, ever since 9-11, of course, have been uh, waking up to that fact. But um, to... Uh, to uh, beat uh, Princeton to the punch. Let me give you a quote that I probably gave on this show before. It's one of my favorites. Uh, This is from 1937. Quote, the United States is owned and dominated today by a hierarchy of its 60 richest families. These families are the living center of the modern oligarchy, which dominates the United States functioning under a democratic form of government behind which a de facto government, absolutist and plutocratic has taken form. This de facto government actually is the government of the United States, invisible, shadowy. It's the government of money and a dollar democracy, unquote. That is Ferdinand Lundberg in his 1937 book, America's 60 Families. So Princeton is a little slow on the uptake, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, there was, in, this, in this report, <laughs> they quote a, a, a lady uh, from uh, Death and Taxes magazine, Robin Panaccia, she says, this is the Dove report. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, this is so how, I mean, we, we're, we're talking about oligarchy. And I guess oligarchy, if you look at throughout history, that's usually how societies are, are run. And I don't think that America is any exception, despite claims of America exceptionalism. Um, because the the moneyed interests have have created these, these institutions and agencies that uh, – you know that pretty much uh, lock up the system for them, rig, rig the system in their favor. Good example with that would be, well, this may not be directly tied to the CFR, but it's the uh, the Federal Reserve System. And, and, well, and the, you've the, written a lot on that, the banking and money, and how control of credit and money is key to keeping this keeping this whole thing together. Correct. Uh, that's correct. In fact, uh, let me just uh, get you um, um, some more names here. Uh, they are CFR uh, connected, and uh, just uh, last year, Obama appointed uh, Janet Yellen, uh, of course, to head the Fed, and Stanley Fisher as vice chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, also Lael Brainerd and Jerome Powell, two positions as governors on the Federal Reserve Board. All four are members of the CFR, four for four, 100 percent. So... Um, uh, it's uh, definitely a controlled system, and just to tie it together, uh, you know, a lot of linkage between the founders of the CFR and the Federal Reserve. In fact, David Rockefeller, who is was, as we mentioned, longtime CFR chairman, still is the honorary chairman of the CFR, is actually the grandson of the legislator who introduced the original Federal Reserve legislation, Nelson Aldrich. Nelson Aldrich, Senator Nelson Aldrich, introduced the original central banking legislation. It was rejected because it was too closely associated with the Rockefellers, so it had to be passed under another name, Glass Owen. But um, uh, David Rockefeller actually is the uh, the the grandson of the uh, the guy who started the Federal Reserve, you could say. So, uh, and of course, his Chase Manhattan Bank m- merged with the Manhattan Bank, which is owned by the Warburgs. And of course, Paul Warburg was the original vice chairman and the brain behind the Federal Reserve at Jekyll Island when it was secretly created. So it all ties together the Fed and the CFR. Yeah, uh, the, the meeting at Jekyll Island, which no one seemed to know about until maybe two decades later when it was written about by one of, the, one of its participants, Frank Vanderlip, mm-hmm. who I think he wrote in 1935 – um, there was an occasion near the close of 1910 when I was, when I, when I was as secretive indeed as furtive as any conspirator. His word is conspirator, <laughs> conspiracy, huh? I did not, I did not feel it was any exaggeration to speak out of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of an actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together. <clears throat> on the night of our departure, we were instructed to come out 
come on at a time as unobtrusively as possible to the railroad terminal of New, of New Jersey, literal, of the Hudson, where Senator Aldrich's private car would be in readiness, attached to a, to the rear end of the train of the, uh, for the south. Once aboard the private car, we began to reserve the taboo that had been fixed on our last names. Discovery, we knew, simply must not happen, or else our time and effort would be wasted. <laughs> so, there you go. Okay. That's right. Genuine and conspiracy. <laughs> definitely. And uh, the people at that meeting uh, included uh, uh, Paul Warburg, who was representing the Rothschilds. And you had Aldrich there. You had uh, Benjamin Strong, who was head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. Henry Davison, senior partner in J.P. Morgan and Company. And Charles Norton, who was head of Morgan's First National Bank of New York. So there you've got the Morgan people. And you'll recall are uh, quoting Carol Quigley earlier on the fact that the CFR was a front group for J.P. Morgan and company. So once again, CFR, uh, obviously, if you are going to create wars, um, you are going to need money for it. And isn't it interesting that uh, just six months after the Federal Reserve was created, uh, December of uh, 1913, Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated, uh, starting the First World War and the uh, Fed help fund it for us and we wound up having our national debt grow from 1 billion to 25 billion uh small potatoes compared to today when we're you know multiple multiple trillions but uh that was a very significant increase at the time uh again the timing not coincidental mm -hmm. and and right because you had the death of uh, the murder of Archduke Ferdinand and his wife and some of people linked that assassination to uh British Freemasonry British uh, uh, agents in, operating operating in the Balkans. Well, I was once talking to a guy who himself was uh, had been a big executive of Fortune 500 company, and I was explaining all this to him, and I said I made that very comment to him that you know just six months after the Fed was founded, you had the uh, assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. He says, "Well, how do you tie that together with the Fed?" And the answer is, uh, it's well, at least it's been testified that. Uh, the assassins were Freemasons sworn to secrecy. Uh, uh, they've been involved in so many intrigues, starting with the uh, French Revolution and the Mancini mm -hmm. Revolutions and the Young Turk Revolutions. They always had the hand of Freemasonry. They're trusted agents because they're sworn to obedience and sworn to secrecy. How do you tie that to the Fed? Well, they were they were uh, Grand Orient Freemasons in that assassination. And Paul Warburg, founder of the Fed, was a 33rd degree Grand Orient Freemason. So it's very easy to see how that network on one level could be operating uh, to at this executive level to create uh, a central bank in America, while at another level they were dispensing orders through a local um, a branch of uh, a local lodge of masonry to these assassins uh, who are simply described in mainstream books as Serbian nationalists to yeah. take out the Archduke. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, well, um, uh, lone nut, right? <laughs> or mad, uh, mad man. Lone nuts in this yeah. case, yeah. <laughs> and, well, the one thing is British Freemasonry itself, particularly British Freemasonry, is, has historians look at it, it, it's a vehicle for destabilization, for revolution abroad. It's the, There's a book called Builders of Empire uh, hmm. that's about British Freemasonry, its role in building and maintaining the British Empire. Um, so this is a this is a practical way which people meet in secret and organize to to uh, to conspire to undermine and to uh, and to um, uh, you know destabilize certain parts of the world. This is what empires do, and British that's just one way that is done uh, is to, through the lodges. You know, so I mean, right, and they also have lodges which uh, are not involved in anything sinister, and those uh, operate as a uh, nice front for those uh, that are operating uh, in a sinister fashion, in a conspiratorial fashion. So uh, very tricky when you have a, a network that is completely secret and legally so, very hard to decipher it without being on the inside. And that, that model is how intelligence agencies operate. So the, the Freemasonic model, is, it's a model. It's a blueprint for revolution or destabilization or subversion that can be applied in 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 very in different circumstances in different ways to achieve an objective, um, and if you examine British imperial policy or of course U.S. foreign policy today, you can see these principles being played out in Syria or even in Europe today. You know, with the destabilization efforts that are going along. So again, it's it's it's, it's sub rosa. It isn't obvious, but just you have to just to analyze the situation, look at the history, and this this stuff isn't um, 
crazy conspiracy stuff. It's stuff that's, that's really happened. And people who've looked closely at things like the French Revolution or the First World War uh, will see these identifying markers of the, the you know, the, the black hand of Freemasonry involved in this, in, in these uh, events. You know? In fact, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting one. Um, this is uh, uh, maybe not be uh, too uh, well taken by uh, some of your more patriotic listeners, but uh, you're, of course, familiar with Paul Revere's famous ride. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sent on that ride by Dr. Charles Warren, uh, and uh, he uh, also sent another writer, uh, William, let's see if I can remember his name, was it William Dawes? Um, and uh, history is basically forgotten, as I have. And uh, they rode out to Lexington, Mass., which is a town I grew up in. And um, they met at the uh, uh, house where John Hancock was staying. Uh, but what uh, history books never mention is that um, Dr. Charles Warren was the uh, uh, Grand Master of St. Andrew's Freemasonic Lodge that met at the Green uh, Dragon Tavern in Boston, and Paul Revere was a member of that lodge. And the second writer, if I remembered his name correctly, Dawes, was also a member of that lodge. And uh, John Hancock was a member of that lodge. So everybody on the circuit of Paul Revere's ride was a member <laughs> of that lodge. And actually, if you go to my website, jamesproloff.com, I've got a pretty unique article there called The Secrets Buried at Lexington Green. I used to walk by Lexington Green with a battle that started the revolution took place. And uh, believe it or not, it was a false flag. But uh, it won't. We won't go into that tonight. But it's no coincidence that uh, the uh, North Branch of a Scottish Rite Freemasonry in all of America has its headquarters right there in the small town of Lexington, Mass. It's it's for they they had a very big hand in the events that took place on April the nineteenth, seventeen seventy five. But that's for another show. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just an example of just how far reaching uh, Freemasonry has gone in uh, generating uh, revolutions that have uh, changed the world order. Well, I, from my understanding, is that, that what happened was when the Illuminati was uh, exposed, they went underground and they infiltrated these the lodges. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the the goal of the Illuminati was the destruction of crown <clears throat> and, and altar. And you could see some of that rhetoric in the Amer people don't like to see this, but that those ideas did uh, inform much of the the, the uh, American War of Independence. You know, Thomas Jefferson and. This idea of um, freedom, equality, uh, and fraternity, or liberty, equality, mm -hmm. and fraternity, which is a Freemasonic, you know, uh, slogan. Right. And so, some people I've heard some people refer to U.S. government. We have a free Masonic republic or democracy now, because it is based on these ideas and the destruction of of the of of uh, you know the idea of le leveling everything and de destroying the, the church is in the name of liberty, and it might have some appeal. Of course, in America, we have the separation of church and state, uh, which isn't in the Constitution. It was written in a letter by Thomas Jefferson to a, a Baptist um, uh, church in Danbury, Connecticut. But it's been applied <laughs> as some sort of constitutional doctrine to uh, weaken the influence of the church in the, in the United States. Um, you can see some sort of Freemasonic you know, strategizing or, or conspiracy in that. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the uh, Freemasons are historically very uh, antithetical towards religion. I once met a Freemason uh, just in a, a business circumstance, and we weren't, you know, not as a writer or anything like that. And he was talking about his uh, Freemasonry, and uh, he was uh, uh, talking about how uh, he was boasting of the fact that at a Catholic church, He'd inscribed images of Satan in the eyes of a statue of Mary, and he was laughing and saying, wow. "Now those stupid Catholics, when they bow down before Mary, they don't know it, but they're uh, bowing down before Satan." And um, they uh, it's always been kind of built into the upper levels of Freemason. It would not be known by a first degree Mason who's just in been introduced. But if you look at the history of the Supreme Court, uh, it was Freemasons like Hugo Black and William Douglas and Earl Warren and Potter Stewart and Thurgood Marshall who have undermined. Uh, the uh, the uh, institution of uh, religious freedom in this country, mm -hmm. you know, uh, starting with uh, throwing s school prayer out and uh, then demanding that uh, the Ten Commandments be taken down. And these were the founding fathers had really intended, maybe they, some of them did intend that. Uh, I'm sure people like Thomas Paine did, but um, uh, it was not written in the Constitution. It's through, uh, I believe, they have greater 
loyalty to their Masonic oath than they do to the oath to uphold the Constitution. That is a big problem with these secret societies. That's true, because the um, the idea of non-established church is only meant to apply to the federal government, because the federal government is supposed to be very weak and very specific. States had established churches, regardless of what what you think of that. It was it wasn't the constitutional, un, it wasn't unconstitutional. States had established churches. Right, yeah. and uh, thank God for. Uh, those uh, anti-federalists who were suspicious enough and demanded that the Bill of Rights be attached because that Bill of Rights has been a, a uh, real barrier mm -hmm. to the imposition of even worse um, police state than we have right now in America. Those rights uh, have, have, uh, have been done right by those rights uh, for, for a long time now, but they are, of course, weakening. And, of course, you see Obama trying to override the Second Amendment with executive orders, and we see just a constant uh, chipping away at the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Yeah, I saw an interesting bumper sticker the other day. I read, uh, the Bill of Rights is my Patriot, Patriot Act. <laughs> sure, uh, that's all you need. <laughs> that's all and, you need. Uh, we <laughs> certainly, uh, as you and I know, um, the uh, we don't need all this uh, Homeland Security because uh, the you know, that as I do, that 9-11 was uh, an inside job mm. uh, with the help of uh, uh, is, is Israelis. And... Uh, uh, the wars that we've had, uh, be it the non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or uh, the unnecessary war in Gaddafi because he was going to introduce the gold dinar or the false claims that uh, Assad had used uh, sarin gas and his own people in Syria. All these wars and all these things have been, ISIS has been, was funded and created by the United States. And that was acknowledged by the former director of the Defense uh, Intelligence Agency, Paul, Ron Paul, has uh, talked about that on his weekly show, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, mainstream media is uh, in the CFR not batting an eyelash. It's more, we got to have more war on terror and Hillary and the rest of the candidates are all talking about how they'll uh, carry, carry on the war on terror and we must stop ISIS. But in fact, we've created these enemies. Since we've created the enemies, we obviously never needed the security measures against them or the gigantic defense budget in the first place. That's true. I mean, I remember, um, well, if you go back to the, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, justifications for the creation of the Central Intelligence Agency was the failure to connect the dots regarding Pearl Harbor, <laughs> right? And so, so then we, you know, we we can't have this occur. We need to get some sort of we need some place to coordinate the collate and coordinate this intelligence and give the best advice to the President of the United States. That's what it's supposed to be. Sure, okay. Um, so, but they used the uh, the uh, the. Uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, which we now know they had full knowledge of. In fact, they not only did they provoke it, they knew it was coming, and they wanted that because that, that was how they got in, got into the war. Uh, but there was used an excuse for the Central Intelligence Agency. Fast forward to the future, the excuse for the Department of Homeland Security and the correct it was a director. What's the new office now? Director of Intelligence uh, that they created. I, I don't know on that. Yeah, one. So they created a new office uh, of who's a, sort of like the intelligence czar. To coordinate and conduct all the information, because you all know 9/11 occurred because there was a f f failure of imagination to connect the dots. <laughs> so it's the same thing over again. So it's lies told, and these these events are set up or staged to justify for the consolidation of power. It's you know, but it's nothing. That's nothing new under the sun, though. So, right. Uh, I always learn new things when I'm on your show. Uh, to the last time I learned about uh, why suburbia was created. And uh, I didn't actually know that the CIA was uh, justified on the basis of Pearl Harbor, but I do have an article on Pearl Harbor on my website called uh, Pearl Harbor Roosevelt's 9-11. I actually yeah. wrote my first article on Pearl Harbor as a cover story for The New American in 1986, and I wrote another one in 2001. Uh, they wanted me to write it at that time because more information had come out with Robert Stinnett's book, They Have the Seat, plus they had the Ben Affleck movie um, on Pearl Harbor, and that was before 9-11 had occurred. Uh, so I've written two cover stories for them on Pearl Harbor, but I have a very updated one there. Um, of course, we knew about Pearl Harbor through he, he had all the intelligence he needed. He knew through uh, many personal warnings as well as decoded naval intercepts and decoded uh, mm -hmm. decoded uh, uh, diplomatic intercepts. When I say he, I'm referring to President Franklin D. Roosevelt at full foreknowledge of the attack. All of that was suppressed. So the justification for the CIA, if that was it, uh, completely uh, false, completely phony, and obviously done for other purposes because uh, uh, everybody around Roosevelt uh, knew full well that he had foreknowledge of that attack. And that was not the uh, one that wasn't the finding of but the wartime finding, the court martial uh, of well, of General Short and um, 
uh, Admiral, what was his name again? Admiral Husband Kimmel. Kimmel, yeah. yeah. Uh, what happened in that, to, I'll try to paraphrase it, um, uh, a, a uh, rigged commission called the Roberts Commission, consisting of cronies of Roosevelt and the Army Chief of Staff George Marshall, who we earlier mentioned in connection to the Marshall Plan, uh, found Kimmel and Short guilty of dereliction of duty. Well, when Kimmel and Short learned from their Navy buddies and Army buddies that Washington had had these decoded intercepts warning of the attack, uh, they they wanted to be court-martialed, and uh, so it could be uh, the matter could be settled in a real courtroom. And Roosevelt forbade court martial saying it would uh, endanger national security in wartime, blah, blah, blah. Well, eventually, Congress demanded there be tr uh, trials held, and the Naval Court of Inquiry and Army Pearl Harbor Board uh, convened in 1944. They both uh, exonerated uh, those officers and found Washington completely guilty. And the Army Pearl Harbor Board actually concluded by saying that Washington knew everything that Japan was planning to do up to the morning of December the 7th, 1941. I almost gave you an exact quote there. But all of those findings were suppressed by Roosevelt in the interest of national security. He then had new investigations conducted in which uh, Army and Navy officers were browbeaten into changing their testimony, all except for a couple brave ones who stuck to their guns, like Captain Lawrence Safford, uh, who uh, was the father of uh, Navy cryptography. And so the, uh, the findings were overturned. And uh, interestingly enough, the um, the man who overturned the uh, the Army or Pearl Harbor Board's findings was a major. Um, oh, his name is going to escape me right now. But he was later appointed the head of all Freemasonry in America. So, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. His name was Henry Clausen, Major Henry Clausen, later Lieutenant Colonel Henry Clausen, became the uh, he had the same position, uh, I forget the name, it's a long title, same position that, that Albert Pike had, but he certainly got his reward mm -hmm. for overturning that uh, finding on Pearl Harbor. But the truth about that is known in books like uh, Day of the Sea, which I mentioned by Robert Stinnett. I, I, my personal favorite is uh, Infamy by John Tolan, the, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner and fell out of favor because he started to tell the truth about history when he, he dug uh, deep into the archives. Yeah, that, yeah his, that was the, was like, 81 or 82 when that book came out, Dave DC? Uh, 80, uh, Dave DC was 2000, and Tolan's book was, uh, I believe, 83. His, that was Deceit at Dawn, right? Um, uh, it was called uh, uh, Infamy. Infamy, okay. And Day of right. Deceit. Uh, there's another one, um, which is uh, At Dawn We Slept by um, Gordon Prang, but Gordon, Gordon Prang is very much a government apologist. He worked for the government, and... Um, his whole uh, objective was to try to discredit the uh, uh, truth movement on Pearl Harbor. Was he the one that helped, helped produce Torah, Torah, Torah? Yes. He had a big hand in that movie, which makes it look like it was a uh, – I did a show with Corbin on that movie. Yeah. And the movie tries to make it sound like it was a long series of accidents, slip-ups, and happenstances that led to it. Kind of similar to 9-11 when you know, we just goofed up and you know, we just didn't you know, pay attention to the reports. And, you know, and there were exercises going on and nobody noticed. And you know, the planes didn't get out. You know, the, the fighter jets didn't get off in time to intercept the, the airliners before they struck, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I almost laugh when I watch that movie now. <laughs> You're like Frank Knox driving around Washington trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> George Marshall's riding riding his horse or something. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That was one of the longest horseback rides in history. You know, they were trying to, to reach him so they could get his authorization to uh, call Pearl Harbor. And uh, he, he took this three-hour horseback ride. He was actually uh, at the airport meeting the Soviet um, uh, ambassador. Uh, I was giving the good news that uh, we're about to become a – Soviet Union's ally in the war. Mm. And then when he finally showed up at his office, he refused to call Pearl Harbor. All he had to do was pick up the phone and many lives would have been saved. But he insisted on sending a telegram, which went by Western Union and arrived several hours after the attack. That was He sent the, he sent the warning to make himself look good, but he made sure it did not get there in time. Uh, these are, these are uh, facts that you can read about in these books I've mentioned, but also in my article on my website, 9-11 uh, Ro uh, Roosevelt's, uh, I'm sorry, Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt's 911. Yeah, they have in, in Torah, 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 they have the, the cable showing up. And you're supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be like, sort of like an ironic moment or something. 
but you know, yeah, he could have picked up the phone and he, there's a direct line. <laughs> he says, I think I'll send it <laughs> Pony Express or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. well, he'd known about the attack for a long time, but he had yeah. to hold off. And uh, actually, Roosevelt sent a plea for uh, to uh, to uh, to Hirohodo to uh, for peace. He sent it on the evening of December the sixth as he was composing his Day of Infamy speech, so he could say to the world, oh, I made a last-minute plea for peace, but alas, I was too late. Same thing with Marshall. They wanted to they wanted to look good, but the, both of them knew, uh, were deeply involved with this. By the way, Marshall, also a high-ranking Freemason. Well, cause this is after uh, Prince Kanoya, the Japanese prime minister, had proposed coming all the way to America to meet Roosevelt to, to uh, settle things, avoid war. Uh, and I guess that would have been the summer of 41, and that refusal led to Prince Kanoya's resignation and the ascension of, uh, of uh, Tojo at, as, pri- as prime minister. And they knew exactly – you know, obviously Roosevelt knew by doing that he, he could provoke that response in Japan and give more power to the war party in Japan you know, so, the, so the attack would occur. He could corner Japan into attacking. So yeah, it was a complete setup. You know. yeah, everything from the placing of the fleet in Pearl Harbor against all naval advice to the uh, embargo on Japan, which was strangling it economically, yeah. uh, which uh, finally they had uh, no, no recourse but to go to war because either it was starve uh, or uh, obey America's demand to pull all troops inside of Japan, which would have meant communism sweeping the Asian continent, uh, which is what the statements had forewarned of and which is exactly what happened uh, as soon as the war was over, well, that's very, yeah, yeah, that's very interesting because, um, well, one thing is, yeah, the, the Japanese invasion of the of the Dutch East Indies was necess- was necessitated, or at least brought on by the embargo, and they knew that would happen. And I, I still don't know why U- U.S. farm boys sh- should die for the sake of you know European colonies in Asia, uh, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> issue. You know, it's like between you know, Japanese aggression in, in Asia. Yeah, it's in Asia. That's the operative. <laughs> point there. It's in Asia. It's not in, against the United States. But, you know, but of course, the U.S. interest in Asia, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the irony is that Japan uh, for the long, for several decades was the American, was the uh, American Empire's cat's paw. Uh, and then uh, when Japan got really too big for its britches uh, and started to be somewhat independent, it needed to be, uh, you know, knocked down and declawed. And that's what, that's pretty much what you got in the, in the Pacific War. Um, but, uh, you had, you know, the, the intrigues with George Marshall and you know, the loss of China to, to the, uh, to Mao, uh, all that involves some of the diplomatic, uh, missteps supposedly with Stalin. Want to go into that? And what does that reveal about what was really going on with U S foreign policy at that time? Well, of course, uh, the objective of, um, the, the Rothschilds had been, uh, the establishment of a world government uh, under Zionist control and communism, which was funded out of uh, the Bolshevik revolution, of course, was funded by the uh, the Warburgs and the Schiffs and the Rothschilds. Uh, uh, they were trying to, uh, one of the, you mentioned that Japan was one of our, our cat's paws. Actually, the Rothschilds supported Japan in the 1904-1905 war against Russia because Russia was then under the control of the Tsar and they wanted to deal him a blow. But as communism expanded and it started to move now, into oh, so, Asia, you know, was Jacob Schiff an agent of the Rothschilds? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, he was uh, the uh, head of Kuhn Loeb, and his uh, partner at Kuhn Loeb was uh, Paul Warburg, who founded the was the first vice chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Okay, so here we have Paul Warburg. Okay, he's instrumental in sending Trotsky back to Russia. Oh, uh, a Schiff was anyway. Schiff uh, okay. gave Trotsky twenty million in gold, and uh, but the, the, his firm. The wall uh, yeah. Okay, and so who sent Lenin back to Russia? That was uh, uh, Paul Warburg's brother, Max Warburg, uh, <laughs> gave Lenin the convinced the German government to send Lenin with gold on a train into Russia. So you had Lenin and Trotsky both being sent in from the outside with outside funds to overthrow the Tsar. Okay. Now, this is interesting because my, the way it's understood in in the the uh, tr- conventional rendering of that history is that Germany is sending Lenin. Back to Russia to destabilize it, so they can win the war in the east. That's what they wanted. Okay, yes. from the standpoint of the central powers, you can say okay, there's some there's some logic to that. There was, but why would the the Allied powers send Trotsky 
back to Russia to destabilize Russia. <laughs> well, this is what they ran into when Trotsky uh, landed in Nova Scotia. When I say landed uh, with his ship, uh -huh. he was arrested by the Canadian authorities because the Canadians knew that Trotsky intended to foment a, re a revolution, which would take Russia out of the war and would mean more Canadian soldiers would be killed on the Western Front. However, at the behest of uh, Schiff and the banksters, Woodrow Wilson intervened and pressured the Canadian government into releasing him. It was not in the West interest to have the yeah. Bolshevik Revolution take place because it did mean that more Americans, British and Canadians would get killed. The banksters didn't care. They wanted that revolution to take place so in 1917. 1917. Yeah, OK. What this suggests is at a meta level, the, the strategic objectives of the First World War, the Allied powers, are secondary. There's something going on at a meta level here, meaning that the elite are pulling the strings. They're 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 setting things up uh, that don't that make very little sense, uh, or, or it's hard to reconcile with uh, what the people are being told. What the First World War is being fought for, correct? Uh, I can give you half a dozen reasons for the First World War. Number one, to create world government. That's your League of Nations. Number two, to foment the Bolshevik Revolution, mm -hmm. which is your first step towards uh, world total totalitarianism. Number three, to create the Balfour Declaration. Uh, note that the Balfour Declaration, Bolshevik Revolution, and American Declaration of War all come in 1917. Uh, the Balfour Declaration, of course, is where Britain promised to uh, create a Jewish homeland in Palestine in exchange for the Zionists bringing Woodrow Wilson and the Americans into the war. So that's your first, uh, that's a blow in the favor of Zionism to the first step towards the creation of the state of Israel. But other purposes of the war included profiteering. Uh, Bernard Brooke and his friends uh, made six billion in uh, money stolen from the American people for war munitions that were never manufactured or delivered to the front. All of that came out in the Graham Committee of Congress post-war, but all the indictments were quashed, of course. The war also generated the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1917 and 1918, under which hundreds of Americans were prosecuted, but not one German spy. Anybody who dissented with the war, even with disagreeing with the idea of profiteering from the war, was uh, prosecuted and some were sent to jail for as much as 20 years. So there was a tremendous suppression of civil liberties, very similar to what we saw after 9-11. This is all happening 100 years ago, mm -hmm. we're talking about. And uh, so uh, those are some of the reasons, the true reasons for uh, the First World War, a very uh, multidimensional war, but most of them are. Uh, if you look at uh, the Middle East now, yeah, part of it's about uh, oil, part of it's about profit and debt, but a big part of it is about creating greater Israel. But so, behind, yeah. if you look, you know, people like Lenin and Trotsky. Behind every revolution, there's a banker paying for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, even with uh, Marx, Marx had his angles, right? Uh, Engels was extremely wealthy, which yeah. you would not expect. You're supposed to think that these guys are, you know, street level poor revolutionaries who are uh, working on behalf of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. And it, and I think ultimately this this goes back to uh, the uh, Christus strategy of Freemasonry. Freemasonry uh, yeah. is is heavily uh, uh, involved with this. In fact, uh, uh, Lenin and Trotsky were both Freemasons. Uh, I know what's funny about yeah. this. Again, we got the whole, the whole Cold War thing is um, at one level. A good example is is the after World. Just jump ahead to after World War II, and we have mm -hmm. the, the the early Cold War period, and of course Nixon's making his. Uh, Cutting his political teeth on the on the Hiss case, Alger Hiss, right? And Alger Hiss is exposed as a communist spy. Though he probably wasn't active at the time anymore. But what it looks to me is that after war, there was a, two different factions uh, in the U in the United States. There was roughly you could say maybe the pro Nazi side, which is kind of the Dulles, uh, uh, uh wing, and the pro Russian side, which is the Hiss wing. And there was a conflict between the two, and that's why Hiss was ultimately exposed. Also, because he was a communist spy, it's because he was, at that time, the uh, the Dulles faction was in the process of winning out, uh, you know, getting control of the national of this fledging national security state. And um, although they were part of this part of the same globalist project, you had different factions, kind of uh, fighting it out, and which is why ultimately Hiss took took you know, took the fall for uh, for that. Um, because he was getting, you, were, you remember this. This goes back to kind of like you know the, the Morgenthau plan to destroy Germany, 
and how that was rejected because the people in the United States realized they needed a strong West Germany, supposedly to hold back you know the red tide. But the original plan was was to destroy Germany economically. Uh, there was definitely a uh, Zionist plan of vengeance yeah. uh, against Germany that even preceded the war itself. Yeah. Um, and uh, I can't remember if it was off the air or on there. Or we talked about the fact that uh, there had been a plan for war with Germany going back to Milner in 1900. Oh, yeah, yeah. That um, goes back to British strategy. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, one, you could look at the whole destabilization of Germany. Germany thought it needed to destabilize. I'm sorry. Great Britain felt it needed to destabilize Germany because it was too strong on the continent. And uh, uh, the broad look at it, the broad uh, um, perspective is that the rise of Hitler itself was seen as sort of a a strategy that went awry, and they didn't foresee maybe France collapsing, and all of a sudden there, there's Germany driving deep in there into Russia, and that's when you see FDR really stepping up uh, his efforts to provoke war with Japan. So this is an example where these things are being manipulated, but they're not always controlled. They can't control events perfectly. Yeah, uh, I would say that you're uh, you're absolutely spot on there. Uh, when the Germans and their allies invaded Russia, Operation uh, Barbarossa, June the 22nd, 1941, I stress allies because of the, the common perception today is this was simply a German plan of conquest. Well, Operation Barbarossa wasn't just the German army. It was the army of, of Finland, uh, Italy, Romania, Croatia, and Hungary, as, uh, as well as 47,000 Spanish volunteers that... Uh, joined during the course of the war and two divisions of Belgian uh, soldiers, that, which comes as a real shock to people, a Flemish speaking Belgian uh, unit and a, a French speaking one. And their goal was to destroy Bolshevism, which was uh, the uh, brainchild and uh, uh, the uh, uh, s sacred creation of uh, the uh, Zionist banksters. And uh, it was uh, about... July the 1st, uh, 1941, when, um, well, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact date, but it was about a month after that invasion when the reports started coming in that Stalin's troops were collapsing. Because to tell you the truth, the Russian troops didn't care that much about Stalin. Um, and they weren't that sorry if he went. And uh, it was when the reports started coming in, that is when uh, you will find historically when Roosevelt uh, instituted his oil embargo on yeah. Japan. The idea being to make sure that Japan, which had signed the anti common turn pact, the anti communist pact with Italy and Germany, made sure that uh, they didn't invade from the east because if they did, Stalin would have been caught in a vise and uh, Bolshevism, which they had created, the banks that had created, would have been destroyed. That's what made Pearl Harbor necessary. Mm -hmm. That's why the embargo, uh, that's why all the provocations toward Japan, to make sure. That they struck to the, to, as you mentioned, the Dutch East Indies to the south instead of hitting Russia mm -hmm. to their east, so to their west, excuse me. Yeah, you can see that. And, well, what's going on there is, um, again, if you look at the the research of Anthony Sutton mm -hmm. and why Wall Street was funding uh, the Bolsheviks, they also funded Hitler, but it might have been another motivation there, um, is he, he, his idea was, that, was his idea of captured markets. And I think he's, he's looking to set as a business plan, as, a, as he's not really getting into this, maybe the uh, esoteric or or philosophical or even spiritual dimension of this. But he's dealing with the fact that that if you de if you can destabilize Russia, all those resources that are in Russia are locked up for a while, or you can get at them cheaply because that's what the Harrimans did, and that's what their, the Rockefellers did, and all that. They got all the you know in return for all the factories that they built. They got a lot of these resources. So that's how they got paid. That's how why you know Ford, Ford and uh, plants were being built in Russia. They were being paid with with uh, you know with uh, with resources. Um, but the idea there, according to Anthony Sutton, was to keep Russia weak. Again, Russia itself, uh, much like Germany, was coming on strong in the in the early 20th century, and needed to be destabilized. Of course, the Zionist the Jewish angle is, of course, they had a vendetta against Russia because of the Pale Settlement and how they were treated in Russia. So there was a hatred. Of uh, of the Russian uh, reg of the Tsarist regime in Russia because it was still one of the first ones that actually still was a was a uh, identified itself as a Christian you know crown a throne and <clears throat> that's why you had so much antipathy towards uh, the Russian Tsar 
uh, and on Wall Street. Um, so you, you have a lot of these factors. You have that, and of course, you have the long-term British British objective uh, with the McKinder Doctrine, where you have to weaken the continental powers in order to uh, maintain the dominance, you know, of of the seas and and their empire. Uh, but the the point is that <laughs> the point is because the wars that were fought had nothing to do with what the uh, the public was told, or why their their sons were being murdered in hundreds of thousands, you know. So yes, and hasn't that been the truth uh, throughout history? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's pretty hard to find a, a war we've been involved with where the true purpose of the war was uh, what the public was told. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about the American Revolution or the Civil War or uh, the Spanish-American, the invasion of Veracruz, World War One, World War Two, Korea, which is all about validating the, the UN uh, uh, to go, go through Vietnam and uh, all the Middle Eastern wars. Mm -hmm. We've never really been told the truth. It's always been for an alternative objective. And the controlled media, which we talked about early in the program, uh, has always carried the uh, the misinformation to the public. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important for people to tune into shows like yours and uh, to start uh, discerningly listening uh, and reading alternative media instead of the controlled by six giant corporations, mainstream. Because mm -hmm. it is all controlled. It's all controlled by the same parties. It's controlled by outfits like the CFR. Of course, we also have outfits like the Trilateral Commission, which is sort of a, a um, you know, a spinoff of the CFR or a, a uh, you know, continuation of that theme. Uh, I guess it applied to the era of the '70s when it tried to do a deal. That anticipated the CFR is more of a, an American European thing with the Trilateral. Uh, were created to involve uh, at the time with uh, Asia, developing Asia. I guess Japan and yeah, it was the uh, the three legs of uh, yeah. Europe, Asia, and America. And uh, it was actually a creation of uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski and David Rockefeller. And and Rockefeller was chairman of the CFR at that time. But like the Bilderbergs, it was one of those ways of interconnecting these uh, uh, agents of government power and industrialist across the world for that goal of consolidation that we talked about earlier, uh, like Bilderberg, like Bohemian Grove, it's mm -hmm. one more uh, means of networking uh, between the uh, powers that be to bring a, uh, to fruition their ultimate goal of a world government. And trilateralism itself, uh, a good example of their influence was, th you know, just four years after being uh, created, uh, uh, they, I think it had maybe close to 90 American members. And a close to a third of those 90 members would uh, infest the Carter administration. Right. Uh, according to Zbigniew Brzezinski in his memoirs, uh, every key policymaker in the Carter administration was a member of the Trilateral Commission. But interestingly, Jimmy Carter in his memoirs never mentioned the Trilateral Commission by name once. Although he was a member, right? He was a member, yes. Yeah. He was a found one of the founding members. <laughs> That's he right. Was, and he was picked, I guess it was that meeting at the David Rockefeller's Terrytown Estate or something. Where mm -hmm. was, and then all of a sudden the media, just a good example of how the media is controlled, because all of a sudden Jimmy Carter became the candidate. That's right. right. Uh, nine months before the convention, less than 4% of all uh, registered Democrats favored Jimmy Carter for president. So what happens is he's on the cover of Time three times, and Time's cover artist is told to make him look like John F. Kennedy. And he's on the cover of Newsweek twice, and the Wall Street Journal has an editorial saying he's the best candidate of all the Democrats. And the New York Times runs a series of puff pieces on him. And so he gets the nomination. And like I always say, uh, Tim, you and I could become president and vice president if the powers that be chose to. They could bring us out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> they get us elected, you know, and, pe and then people would think there's nothing really strange about it. Oh, it's almost like, yeah, like the uh, the show Being There, right? The movie Being There. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. Of course, there. Of course, there they, it was it was created spontaneously, but it was funny how because uh, um, he had no he had no uh, he came out of nowhere because he was hiding in that estate his entire life, so no one no one knew who he was. <laughs> so. There there seems to be a uh, subliminal meaning to that film. You know, I I, I saw it in the seventies when I was politically uninformed, or was it the seventies or was it early eighties? Peter Sellers in that role, yeah. but I do remember that there was a scene uh, with a giant. Uh, a Masonic pyramid in it, mm -hmm. 
and uh, he was uh, mingling with all these wealthy power brokers. And I have to think that there was some kind of significance to that film, uh, uh, some sort of subliminal message, but I'm not sure what it was. I'd have to revisit that. But it was an interesting little bit of uh, film history, very late in Peter Sellers' career, as yeah. I recall. The end when he's walking on water or something <laughs> at the funeral. And, every, and all the guys at the funeral are saying, I think he's our guy. Yes, I think he's our guy. <laughs> hmm. He speaks in these broad generalities. Yeah. These phrases he hears on television, he just repeats. And yes. Yeah, well, very little in, in, in Hollywood like uh, politics happens by accident. So I'm sure there was some um, something beyond entertainment to that film. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, But it was funny because Carter himself, although he was a trilateralist, he was, he was picked. Uh, he was kind of – because, of course, what we know about Watergate was it was more – it wasn't just you know the second rate burglary, uh, and nor was it these crusading journalists or Woodward and Bernstein that took out Nixon. Nixon appeared to be a victim of some sort of intel black ops, and of course um, Woodward himself is has a came from naval intelligence, and many of the principal figures of the Watergate scandal had direct ties to intelligence. So it, it appeared to be a coup uh, to unseat Nixon, um, and so considered that envi- considering that environment. Um, Carter was picked, and um, but he seemed to rebel a little bit because I, I do you remember the the Halloween massacre of it, at CIA, and um, that's when um, Bush and uh, what, uh, Ted Shackley and, and they started, you know, they all started the Safari Club, this private intelligence network, and uh, and that involved you know funding of the um, the beginning of the uh, Afghan operation. And all these, uh, uh, you know, the, all these uh, illegal arms sales, and so Carter seemed to be somewhat of a somewhat of a reformer, who was taken out. And that's of course that goes back to the um, the intrigues involved surrounding the uh, Iranian hostage crisis, where some people think that was orchestrated to uh, weaken Carter. We, uh, at the very least, it appears to be uh, the uh, crisis was was lengthened uh, to un- to weaken Carter. Uh, you know, with the uh, October surprise thing, so. Uh, for some reason or other, they uh, <laughs> they didn't like Carter, so he was taken out. <laughs> you know, so uh, maybe he seemed to serve them uh, well in a number of ways. In fact, uh, he was. Uh, uh, if you go to my website, I have a uh, article there uh, goes back uh, some years to the New American uh, called "Iran and the Shah: What Really Happened." And Carter certainly played a very significant role in undermining the Shah. Mm-hmm. And uh, that actually traces to Henry Kissinger. You know, uh, there's a big link up, uh, as we've already talked about, between Democrat and Republican. And, um, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter uh, de-recognized Free China. He broke our relations with Free China, even mm-hmm. though the uh, Congress had voted unanimously that he should first consult that body, waited for Christmas. But you can very easily see that what Kissinger did in taking Nixon to to China was paving the path for uh the diplomatic changes that Carter made. In the same way, Henry Kissinger was the one who initiated the plan to destabilize and overthrow the Shah because he was going to nationalize, much as his predecessor Mossadegh had done and tried to do in the 50s, going to try and nationalize oil in, in uh, Iran. And that set the plan in motion. And Carter began screaming about human rights abuses by the Shah, which, uh, which had not been uh, a subject, media, subject of media discussion before. And he was very instrumental in that, and it seemed like uh, he was carrying out their uh, their orders pretty well. But uh, I wasn't really familiar with that um, uh, CA Halloween event you mentioned. Um, uh, so there, you know, there certainly may have been things going on that uh, I was not aware of that that caused conflict. Certainly, well, he, he had he, uh, he fired George Bush. Okay. Yeah, and right. then brought in Stansfield Turner, his naval buddy, who was who actually was uh, new to intelligence. Was George Bush was supposed to be an intelligence oh, okay. person? Okay. All right. And so these guys don't go don't go quietly into the night. And Ted Shackley, <laughs> who had eyes on the directorship, was, was was kicked out. But you know, these guys had all these intelligence networks uh, established, uh, you know, hmm. through the various uh, black op dealings. So they established, you know, that the, the the story was. In the post-church uh, committee hearings in the late 70s, the CIA was defanged and Congress wasn't happy to fund anything. So they had to find alternative ways to fund their various operations right. and black ops. Makes so they, sense. They established the, the Safari Club, which was a private intelligence fund. It was funded by Saudis, Iran, you know, the Gulf states, uh, South Africa to, print, to keep, the, keep his operations going uh, in the meantime. 
before they got Carter out. And eventually they got Carter out. There is some evidence to suggest <clears throat> that the Iranian the hostage crisis itself uh, was precipitated. And, not, and what really happened was, it was, I think it was Kissinger who told Carter to accept the Shah uh, you know, into the country to get treated for cancer, knowing full well that this would cause an a, 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 a embassy to be, to be overrun and create the hostage crisis. And the hostage crisis created the pretext for the U.S. government to seize Iranian assets. And these were funds that were in Chase Manhattan Bank. And Chase Manhattan Bank was over the water. It was apparently in some financial trouble. And um, the seizing of the assets kept the money in the Chase Manhattan Bank. <laughs> well, now that's a piece of history that uh, was a blank page for now, me. That, Thank that's, you for filling that in. Now that's speculative. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking. You're looking at who benefits. I'm doing a you know who benefits analysis here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's you know it's not they're not beyond doing that. Nor are they they're beyond you know the idea of uh, of Bush and um, and uh, and Casey uh, meeting with the Iranians, told them to, to keep the keep the hostages. Uh, held until the inauguration day, until after Reagan is elected, and um, you know that's the another uh, angle to this. And, I remember that well when, uh, as soon as uh, Reagan was in, the hostages were freed. Yeah, and there was, of course, the time was played up because Reagan was was tough and blah blah mm -hmm. blah. No, but really, looking back at it, it's, it's fairly obvious. Um, Plus the fact that neither Bush nor Casey can account for their whereabouts on those days. So, and you've witnesses that they did fly there. Um, and what uh, the interesting side story of that is one I forget the one of the witnesses was an arms trader pilot who uh, claimed that he did fly uh, Bush to Paris that day when Bush said he wasn't there. And there's some evidence that actually they came out and it was they had a credit card receipt from that pilot in Seattle, Washington, on the very day he said he flew to Paris. Uh, the only problem is they found out that the credit card receipt was was fraudulent. So, so what does that mean? It means that, who, that someone's trying to debunk this witness, and they have the the what they did is they created a cr fake credit card. They had the bill to make a, cr a fake credit card receipt, you know, with the, with the stamping, with the date, and the restaurant and all that. Uh, but they got the, the there was no the waitress. They got the name of the waitress wrong or something. <laughs> it was like there's no waitress by the name working there. So it was a, it was a bad. It was a. Um, it looks like an, a, 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 a very sophisticated way to to, uh, to mm -hmm. frame the witnesses as a per, perjurious witness. Right, and uh, sounds like uh, something that uh, the CIA yeah, got exactly. type of thing they would specialize in. Yeah, yeah, and you know, the idea, giving all the things that the intelligence agencies do and the powers that be do, the idea of holding, making the hostages stay there, you know, cool their heels for another sixty, ninety days, isn't. To me, in, in the history of things, isn't that outlandish? So to me, it's not hard to believe at all, <laughs> considering some of the things they do. Sending sixty American, sixty thousand Americans to die in Vietnam for no good reason, and getting mm -hmm. a couple million Vietnamese killed in the process, so they can sell helicopters and bring in their opium. I mean, or bring in their heroin. So that's really from the whole scheme of things, it's really not not that bad. <laughs> well, let me ask you this: uh, I know that we've uh, we've covered a lot of topics yeah. tonight, but uh, just curious. Now, you said that. Uh, the plan was to use the hostages as an excuse to seize Iranian assets. Now, when they released the hostages, did the Iranians get the assets back? Only partially. No, even now, that's well, they got the. <laughs> well, there you go. Right. <laughs> they did not get all. In fact, they still, they only got partial. I recall, only got a, a portion of it back, and to this day, assets are still being held. Huh. But but there's no honor among thieves, is there? So there's a, and there's always a financial subtext to all of these things. Some people think it's all about money, but. Uh, of course, you've you've heard all the stories about uh, shen financial shenanigans on 9/11, from yeah. short selling to uh, uh, gold bars being driven out of trucks that morning yeah. before the the, the, the uh, buildings collapsed. Well, there's always a financial element, but that's not the only element. Uh, right. There's that's uh, why we say that multidimensional. It's multidimensional, and I think ultimately that's it's like for these people, it's not it's not so much about money; it is about control and power because they they make the money. So, you know. And which ultimately, I think, goes back to uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, temptation in the desert when the uh, kingdom and Jesus has, thrown, has shown the kingdoms throughout the world. So I will give you power, dominion over these things. All you have to do is bow at my feet, and Jesus refuses. And I think I think you, as you wrote in uh, in your latest book, uh, other other parties haven't haven't been so <laughs> haven't been so I guess opposed to bowing at his feet. So, right. Jesus did not accept the kingdoms, but he didn't yeah. deny that Satan could make good on that promise to give them to him. Yeah. And it appears that 
Uh, indeed, if you look at uh, the works of Ted Gunderson, a uh, former uh, high-ranking FBI official, or John Coleman, former MI6 officer, or uh, William Guy Carr, who was a Canadian intelligence, they all said the power elite are actually Satanists and worshippers of Satan. And uh, so uh, the idea that Satan would give power to these same people, uh, even though we don't uh, see what happens at the very highest level of interaction, I do believe that uh, something very dark and sp just darkly spiritual is being carried out uh, that we see um, executed at our, our level in the wars and the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the global uh, transitions, that uh, negative transitions that take place. Yeah, um, it's hard to, when you look at some of the things that are done in, in, you know, in the name of, uh, of empire, all the death and destruction and the su human suffering that's created by these policies, uh, it's hard to come to come to some other conclusion, you know, that they've sold their soul. So, right. Uh, Jesus said you should know them by their fruits and their fruits have been consistently bad for the economy, for our health. When I'm we talking about vaccines, GMOs, chemtrails, uh, you know, uh, uh, processed foods and so forth, uh, the deaths and wars, the, the, uh, the debt created by the Federal Reserve. Everything these guys do is bad. So uh, uh, they're certainly not just clumsy and stupid. They're definitely evil. And we're seeing that evil played out on the American people uh, who need to wake up out of their slumber and their sleep and stop watching Fox and CNN. And as we said, turn into alternative media and start to really put it together and figure it out and understand uh, not only where these bad guys fit in, but where we fit into the grand scheme of the universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely, and, and by all means, uh, read. <laughs> Spend more time reading. It's more of a intellectual exercise. Your brain gets mm -hmm. better. You, get, you you become a better thinker, uh, and you uh, can uh, break away from the uh, from the uh, flickerate of, of the TV screen, or you know, so it helps your your brain function. Oh, well, Tim, I'd much rather watch a, a few hours of soap opera than open, crack open a book. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to think. I don't want to spend a whole day thinking. It, uh, it's been a whole day working. I don't have to come home and have to think. And that's because that, that's another scan they have on us, too. Keep us doing that rat race on the. Uh, so you're so exhausted and tired. All you want to do is veg out watching, you know, eating junk food and watching TV. So. Well, that's that's the plan. Have everybody work two jobs because of debt and inflation and then. Uh, you're too, so exhausted, you get home, you turn on the, the boob tube and does nothing but uh, that pre-programmed entertainment, which is my, you know, de uh, designed to keep you misinformed and ill-informed and distracted while uh, they complete their plans for world domination. So you're exactly right. That is exactly it. Uh, uh, eat, TV, uh, work, sleep, get up, work, more TV, et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. cycle. Well, James, I want to thank you for coming on and spending so much time with me tonight. Well, I want to thank you for hosting me. I, you've had some fabulous guests. Uh, I was talking about this with you uh, off air, but I looked at your recent lineup of shows. The last one was Corbett on the uh, Manchurian Candidate. You seem to have some really fascinating guests and topics, and uh, I'd love to just take a day. And it wouldn't be mindless entertainment either. It would be entertaining, <laughs> but it would be, be far from mindless. And just listen to uh, a bunch of these shows that you've done because you've had some terrific guests and topics recently. So, well, so, thank you. Well, well thank done you. on uh, putting together um, a lot of pieces of the puzzle that people need to know about. Yeah, and a lot of the stuff is food for thought. Um, I by no means an expert, nor do I have all the answers, nor do I completely understand these things. I, like everyone else, I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in this crazy world. And... Um, so uh, you know, as the evidence, uh, uh, as I gather evidence, uh, and I, 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 I draw the inferences, and uh, you know, and have my views of these things, but they do change as I see the evidence. So it's one of those things where um, we talk about uh, these various events. None of us have the power of subpoena to go in and these <laughs> documents and put them in court. Well, we wish. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're stuck. Uh, we're we're both in the dark and trying to you know, f you know f figure out what we're touching and. So we are at a distinct disadvantage, uh, but again, it's it's uh, when you I'm rambling now, but again, just well, I'm just one person here. You're just one person here, or you you know who tries to look at the evidence and uh, do the research and try to figure out what's going on in this world. Because we one thing we're all sitting is we have we have not been told the truth. That's right, and uh, we've actually made fantastic progress in that quest for truth. Uh, so much has been uncovered, and. 
thanks to the internet, things that used to be only known in dust, uh, dusty hardbacks that were long forgotten on bookshelves have now uh, found their ways uh, onto uh, search engines. And uh, we can instantly access information that before we would have had to travel across the country to get to a research library to find. So um, information is available and uh, great progress has made, made. I'm thankful to God that we've been able to do it and to um, overcome so many of the lies and deceit. There's still many things. And like you, Tim, I'm constantly learning. Like I say, I, I learn new things every time I'm on your show from you, probably things that you either picked up from your individual research or from uh, the many interesting guests that you have on. Definitely, we're constantly definitely. learning, but I feel that uh, confident that uh, we're uh, it's clear that we're on the correct path. We're simply peeling off the layer of lies that have been um, uh, shoved off on us by the mass media. One by one, they're coming off. And as each uh, light comes off, the, the whole picture becomes clearer. I'm, I'm glad of this. That's so true. I mean, I just remember just a few years ago, uh, the idea of trying to understand Freemasonry seemed to be like, what? That's weird stuff. That's crazy. And you were, uh, but again, it's amazing just how central Freemasonry is to the modern world. In fact, the, I was reading a book the other day uh, about, um, about another topic, but there was a paragraph in there that said, the modern world is Masonic. <laughs> I believe that as you know, a so, fair description. Yeah, yeah. The whole world has has become Masonic, and that's that was a great way to put it. Because that the, how we view the world, uh, how we're told to view the world. If you understand Freemasonry, their image of the world is a free that we see the world in in its image, and that's the true truly revolutionary power of Freemasonry, which I think goes back to Illuminism, which ultimately goes back to uh, you know the temptation in the garden, which is <laughs> what we're dealing with here. I think so. There you go. No, so. Oh, well, listen, James. Thanks again, and we'll we'll talk again soon. Uh, take care, and um, and good night. Uh, good night, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, hope that uh, your listeners uh, also learned something tonight. And uh, look forward to continuing this adventure in the search for truth with you. Oh, well, you're you're most certainly welcome. Good night.